So we have uh, four presentations. We have four presentations in the morning session. <coughs> um, our first speaker uh, is uh, Crystal Loach. Um, she's a professor in the Department of Informatics, uh, IEEE fellow, um, director of our new Master of Software Engineering pro uh, programs, a professional program. Uh, she's gonna uh, she's gonna talk to us about GUT, uh, which is Git, but for objects. That's right. It's a very catchy title. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about a, a thing that I think I was <coughs> looking through my old presentations. I think about two years ago, I made a presentation related to this work that has continued since then. Uh, but it has evolved. So the, the work is in the context of uh, a long thread of development and, and research of mine that I've been doing for the past 12 years or so on uh, virtual, immersive virtual environments and uh, in particular for, for uh, applications like uh, large-scale urban simulations and, um, and, and you know, things like platforms for uh, supporting large-scale virtual conferences and things like that. So very immersive environments where uh, that support uh, a lot of, lot of users, hundreds to thousands of users in the same virtual space at the same time. Um, while they are distributed, geographically distributed across the world. So it's basically a square on, on distributed systems, which is kind of an old, very old friend of mine. Uh, I actually, my master's, uh, my master's thesis way back then was on distributed systems. Uh, so uh, uh, more examples than the urban simulations are things, you know, more little things like, for example, you know, multi-user uh, games. Um, simpler ones, not they don't need to be so immersive, but things like, for example, who remembers Space Race? Please, somebody raise your hand. Yes! All right. Okay, so Space Race was my first video game when I was like 12 years old or something, and I absolutely loved it. I, I, I was playing it all the time in the, the Luna Park, the local Luna Park. Um, so, but you can imagine a Space Race version that instead of just having just one console, you have people over the, over the internet and you have the, the, sh the ships uh, competing with each other over the internet and they somehow they have to share the data. That's basically what, what is going on. The, the other one on the, on the right is Lunar Lander. This is another, uh, another um, uh, interesting sort of game that can be, again, made multi-user distributed where t people are competing and I'll come back to this a little bit more about this competition. But what's going on in these applications? So they are distributed systems. Uh, they have one particular characteristic among all, you know, there are many types of distributed applications, but these ones have uh, a lot of shared states uh, that, um, uh, so, you know, the different nodes of the system are not partitioning the state, they are sharing the same state, they are supposed to be seeing the same things. And uh, another, um, another property is that uh, things change very fast, right? They, uh, things like, uh, you know, a, a, a game like this, the movement of the ship is, is going to be super fast. It's not, uh, you know, the latency here is an issue. We have to minimize, minimize latency across the board. Um, so uh, all, all of these make it a really interesting and challenging types of applications. Um, and I've, again, I've been working on a uh, platform, um, which is sort of a, a, an open source version of Second Life, if you remember Second Life. But a lot of these problems uh, come up there, you know, on a sort of a, that's, that's what the platform has to solve. It has to solve uh, the problem of shared, re replicated shared objects uh, uh, you know, possibly thousands of them in thousands of nodes, and things can can uh, have to to work. Now, my experience with developing this system, this server, uh, that is a second life like server, is that you you know, and most of these game servers, by the way, are sort of like this. You can hammer it and do a, a application specific server that serves a specific application. You know, and does it really fast, and you, you go to the last bit to minimize latency, and everything's super application specific. All the optimizations are application specific. But then, you know, you make one application, you make a server, and then you make another application, you have to re implement the whole thing again because almost nothing is reusable. Only the very low levels of the, of the stack are, are reusable. So, we, uh, 
uh, you know, in, in kind of trying to figure out how we could how we could rethink about this, we, we um, you know, the first version of this was to um, with with uh, Arthur Arthur say hi Arthur is my student back then so in PG thesis was on a on a, um, a framework for supporting these kinds of, uh, of interactive environments. And the idea was to have sort of this, so it was very inspired and aspect-oriented programming, but the idea was, you know, instead of thinking of these servers as, uh, as servers of functionality, what we, what we really need to be thinking is that there is a shared space. So this is shared data, it's a shared data store. Uh, so let's think of it as a shared data store and what we really need to think about now is how to replicate it and how to synchronize the, the, the changes and what to do when, the, when there are clashes, when there are conflicts in the changes. And, and also how to minimize the amount of data that we pass around because not all the nodes need all the data all the time. Uh, in fact, if we can just uh, focus on the changes, that's, that's when you really minimize the, you know, the data that gets passed around. And minimizing the data contributes to lower, lowering the latency. So we, we had sort of a, uh, a, a, an architecture that kind of looked like that and had a sort of this idea of a shared data space that uh, the different nodes would go and pull the changes and, and get the changes from and put the changes in. Um, so uh, since then we kind of uh, evolved this and evolved our thinking and evolved our, our, our wrapping around the problem. And, uh, and basically what has it really emerged is uh, a sort of more, you know, peer-to-peer -peer thing. So let's, let's assume that all the nodes are, they have a, their own authoritative uh, copies of the data. They all can do whatever they want with the data that they have. And now the problem that, as we see it, is the problem of synchronizing all these different replicas. That's basically a data synchronization problem that we need to solve, which is a little bit more general than the previous one. So this, this architecture subsumes the previous one because you can, you can decide that one of them is sort of the master copy and 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 and, and uh, implement what you, what we had before. So so let me let me specify what the design goals really are. It's mark, maximize the availability of the data. So that means that really we really need to replicate the data because the the reaction uh, to the the data has to be immediate to the user. Like we cannot wait for things to go over the network to to have the feedback when we make changes. Uh, we need to support application level, level data synchronization. And uh, again, application level needs to be there. This goes back to a lot of the optimizations that I, I see firsthand that need to be done in these systems. And a lot of these optimizations are not general. You need to be able to at some point say, okay, for this application, this is, this, this is the thing that needs to happen here. And another situation, maybe another, you know, another policy is better. So it's not one, it's, it has to be um, application uh, programmable. Um, we want to support some sort of uh, state cons data consistency, and if you look through the if you look through the system, distributed systems literature, there's a huge you know uh, n papers about uh, mo consistency models. You know, there's a whole hierarchy of co different kinds of consistency models, from the very strong consistency to not consistent at all, and everything in between. And it's a big thing in distributed systems. So we we want somewhere uh, somewhere in the middle. So we don't really need strong consistency because uh, we need availability, most importantly. So strong consistency requires a lot of uh, you know latency to go back and forth so that everybody kind of sees one order of things, and that we don't need that. Uh, we 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 also uh, eventual consistency is not good enough because you know if if the if the ship collides with an as asteroid, we we cannot wait five minutes until that event gets notified, right? It has to be it has to be faster than eventual consistency. Uh, so somewhere along the along the way, there's a, the the concept of causal consistency, which is I could go you know another talk about that, but uh, just it basically the order of events is local, and that a local order is preserved eventually uh, all, in all nodes. So things the, the, there is a uh, you know, whatever the causal relations that are local will, if, when they pass to other nodes, they will also be local there. But but the ordering of it, these blocks can differ. Okay, there's no global order. And again, most important, minim minimize the latency of, of it. Always the, the thing that we that we want to do. So, what was our big idea? Given uh, that you know we have something like this, we slowly but surely 
you know, as we brainstorm through, you know, from where we were three years ago to uh, to trying to improve the what we really thought about the, the system, we came to the conclusion that what we're really trying to do is this decentralized version control. That's what we're trying to do. Okay. The problem of decentralized version control is a problem of synchronizing shared data where the different nodes actually have a lot of autonomy about what to do with the data. There's, there's no master. I mean, you can impose a master in the, in the way that you use the system, but, uh, but in, in, in general, there is no master. And um, what you do, what you do uh, to synchronize the data, in, for example, now this is where I'm going, talking about Git, for example, right? Um, one thing that Git does very well is that when it, pass, when it passes all the changes, it passes them in, in not the entire state, but deltas. It's only what changed. Right? Only what changed gets passed around. So that's a good thing. That's also what we wanted to do. Uh, and, and another thing that happens is that there is this tracking of the changes as sort of a global graph with what changed when that very natural uh, uh, models call the consistency. Right, so a series of commits, local commits, will be seen in that same sequence whenever they get merged to another node, this three. Now, the, the way that these merges are done in different nodes may be different. It's locked, maybe, you know, but 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 there, but there, nothing is broken in, in when things happen in local. So basically, this is where they're going. We decided to go to come out of the closet. We're really doing it, okay? But for objects, so we call it got. Uh, believe it or not, we actually even found out what Git means. Does anybody know what Git means? Git means something. <laughs> it's a um, global information tracker. Okay? And so we thought, okay, so global object tracker it seems like the right thing for us because we're tracking objects, and uh, so we got, we got to go. Ah, it's also not Game of Thrones, but it's uh, <laughs> touch there that it <laughs> coincides with God. So, so, uh, so, really, we're going all the way. We're really doing decentralized version control. And I'll show you how it looks like in the program. But basically, this is how it looks. If you, if just think of Git. Okay? This is the model of Git. You have, you have your, application, your application code, which is your, your, in Git, it's your actions, your own actions, your editing actions and stuff like that. So you have a snapshot. So we're working directly. I'm right? working data. Right? That's where you have your files that are, you are being worked. And then and at points in time, you do commits. What does that mean? The, when you do commits, you commit a, a delta of changes into this version graph. There's a concept of a version graph. And, and the version graph is you have at point in time a revision, and now you're creating another revision, and you're preserving the parentage link. right? And so there's a bunch of, uh, of these links, and you end up with the, with the version graph. So that's all local. So you have it locally from uh, the, the snapshot to the uh, object revision history, the graph. You can uh, uh, commit, you can check out. These are the things that you can merge things. And then from one node to another, so I'm a developer, okay? You are another developer. You're doing lo committing locally. I am committing locally. And then at some point we want to synchronize our changes. I either push to you or, or I pull from you or you pull from me or we both pull from each other. We synchronize, that's when we synchronize, right? And this synchronization now, first of all, is passed through this a series of diffs. It's only what change that comes along. And, and uh, when there are conflicts, it's the interesting thing. Now, what do we do when there are conflicts? And, you know, I was, uh, you know, in a, in a file, in, in the file context, you, uh, there, if there's a, conf a merge conflict, you pop up to the developer, hey, I don't know how to do this. You have to fix it yourself, right? Now, in a live object system, you can't really stop the application and ask the user, hey, I thought uh, this is an inconsistent state. What should I do? You can't do that, right? So, so but the equivalent of asking the user, uh, the way that we uh, are seeing this, is actually giving tools or giving a, a mechanism for the developers to define merge policies. Okay, by in the program, there are special functions that the developers can program, the merge functions, that say, okay, here, and it's through a merge. So given a conflict for a certain <coughs> type of objects, we pass it, you know, here's the, the history of, uh, of where this is happening, basically pointed to the version graph, 
here's the, the current, uh, here's your version, here's their version, and now code up in a little function what should happen. And this, this is actual code, so that we complicate conditions about what should happen when. Right, that's where the application specific policies come into play. So, and again, this is something that we do in Git by asking the develop, you know, the, the person, and, but in a live object system, obviously, we cannot ask the person, but we, we have to have some mechanisms to, to inject application specific merge conflicts. So I, I'll just show you a very, very brief example, um, the space race. And uh, the way that this is distributed is that there's a physics node that has sort of the, the, the that, that runs the asteroids, right? The, the a physics node simulates the asteroids and accepts ships, right? And now there's, uh, so we actually the players uh, are bot players, so these are automated bot players, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But <coughs> and then there's a bunch of visualizers that can join in this ecosystem. Visualizers are, you know, viewers just to visualize the, you know, this thing, the GUI stuff, right? Uh, that can either uh, connect to the bot player, see what, how it looks like, or can connect directly to the physics node, so they can connect in many different ways. So let me just show you how, the, the, this is the physics node. So the physics node, um, uh, oh, we don't see it here, all right, I don't have a pointer. Uh, in the, this is the main function, we start the got node, yeah, this is what we need to do. Start the got node with a, what, what we call data frame in Git is called the repo, repositories, okay? So we have, we give it a name, and uh, we say, okay, run this thing over here. So what, this just plays the game. So let me tell you what the game is, and I'll start you to see some of this uh, operation. So the, the game, uh, this is the initialization. It uh, initializes the asteroids and whatnot. So in initializing the asteroids, it creates the asteroids, and then it adds them all to this is git add, right? It adds them all to the to local repo, okay? This is what it's doing. And then after it adds them, it commits. Okay, this is the first uh, initialization of, of the data, we call this data frame in the repo. And then from then on, there's a play, I don't know if you can read it, but basically the play is in a loop, the way that these games work, there's a, a, loop, a game loop. And at every iteration, you know, there's a certain time that physics runs, and at every tick, it uh, moves the asteroids, okay? And so what we do is that at every tick, we check out, right? We check out the state. We change stuff, you know, check collisions, you know, move the asteroids, check collisions, all that stuff, and at the end, we commit, right? So that's sort of <coughs> what the physics needs to do. The bots, <laughs> an example of a bot. So the bots that are other got, got nodes uh, that run uh, the bot driver function. Um, and, uh, oh, and right, and, and this, they get as an argument the data frame that they are, this is the remote, right? They get the remote uh, to where, which they are going to connect, okay? So from then on, this is what they do. So it, what does the bots do? The bots pull from the remote, okay, this is a, a network, over the network operation, pull. Uh, then they add one player in the beginning, commit the player, then they go on a loop that basically pulls from the remote, changes the state, right, the player decides what to do, go left or right or up or down or whatever, and then commit and then push, right, because we're using the physics node as sort of the, our main repository, my, the share the data that we are using here. So basically, so there's, this, there's this primitive, there's this API that basically offers the, the, the actions of, of decentralized version control, all right? Okay, so applications, agent based simulations, agent based competi competitions, collaborative visualization, anything that needs data sharing with high availability. Uh, an interesting side effect of this model is that we can actually develop interactive debuggers for distributed applications, okay? And well, I'm not going to talk about this, but there is a poster downstairs with uh, one of my uh, students who's developing this, uh, this tool. And the reason why we think of interactive uh, debuggers for, for distributed applications are, are a species that does not exist because it's super difficult, <laughs> as you can imagine. Because uh, you, you know you pause, you breakpoint, and you know what the other guys continue, right? 
But because of this model, because it, we are based on, on the model, on this version graph, we can actually, we have the, the tools and we have the right hooks to stop things. You know, uh, uh, there, there are certain points of these pulls and push operator operations and commits and stuff like that. We can actually pause things and things are actually continue to be ca causally consistent. So that's an, uh, an interesting offshoot of, of the model. Uh, and I'm happy to announce, uh, not uh, the first time, but the second time, so I announced last week at the IGB Symposium, the first uh, multiplier free-for-all reinforcement learning framework that is going to support competitions, hopefully intercollegiate op competitions, uh, for uh, groups of students in AI to train their bots in reinforcement learning. The games are going to be this um, uh, bo blocks and drawn, so very simple uh, games. Uh, and the idea is that uh, our vision is that we're going to have groups of students from all over the US in different universities. They're going to train their bots independently, and then there will be real-time live competitions where they launch their bots from wherever they are. They don't need to be here, right? They, wherever they are, they, they connect to the remote, right, to the repo, and, uh, and, and we'll see which, which bot is actually performs better. So that's uh, AI competitions that are going to happen next uh, there's a better version, uh, version available now. Um, so this is it. Thank you. This is uh, the group of students that are working. This is mostly this second version of, of the, the work is Rohan's um, work. He can't be here today because he had already planned to be some, somewhere else. Priza is the one who is doing the, the debugger, the interactive debugger, and she has a poster downstairs. And Samyak is a visiting uh, undergraduate student from India who's helping out with uh, coding some of these uh, games. So I hope you can all uh, talk to them. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple of quick questions. Hmm? Are, there, are there any significant issues with desyncing? when the nodes compute different results, that would be merge conflicts. Yes, there can be merge conflicts, yeah. There can be merge conflicts. And the way that we deal with this, I didn't, I didn't show here, but there's a paper that you can find in our archive with this title, uh, that we have these special merge functions that you can code up. And it, it, it's three-way merge. So we give you, the, as, you know, give you, the developer, uh, the mechanism to say, okay, under this, history, we give the sort of a link to the version graph, given that you made this change and the other people made this change, what's the right thing to do? Right? And then you can say, well, you know, you can say theirs is better or mine is better or, you know, some other, you know, conditional combination. Is there a master node to ensure that for like online games that one node isn't able to cheat? Uh, that is, uh, no, cheating is application level behavior concerns, right? So cheating, uh, and yes, when you do uh, these kinds of games, okay, there's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, of things that you can talk about the architecture of these online games. So most of them, especially when you don't want to select game standards to cheat, they use a sort of a centralized architecture. We have a server, a game server that ensures that's the authority, authoritative copy, and so you can do that kind of architecture here too. But you can also do peer-to-peer, -peer. and some games are more peer-to-peer. -peer. So it, it depends on the game. Yeah, I was just thinking it used to be an exploit that you could, if you were losing the match, you could desync in a peer-to-peer -peer game, cause right. the player to desync, and then you wouldn't take a loss. Right. Yeah? Because that, the merge only happens locally, okay. right? So if, if the developer has a very long computation in the merge, you know, that's his choice of the choice. But it doesn't affect the other nodes. All merges are done locally. Um, so I'll be around. Ask me more questions if you want. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you. Uh, is Yongchi Zheng. Uh, he's an associate professor, uh, recently moved to uh, Cal State San Marcos, uh, which is close by. He's uh, one of our alumni, um, and so we look forward to hear what uh, he has to say about artificial implementation mapping. Thank you, Sam. Uh, good morning, everyone. 
I'm here to talk about my research of architecture implementation mapping. This is a mechanism that allows the architecture of a software system or the set of principal design decisions about the system to be used as a centerpiece during software development and evolution. That is what we call architecture centrality here. Simply speaking, architecture implementation mapping is just about maintaining the conformance between software architecture and source code. Architecture-centric development specifically requires that the architecture model can be automatically processed to generate, to update, and to identify the corresponding implementation in source code. That is not an easy thing to do. There are two primary challenges involved here. The first thing is there is an obvious abstraction gap between software architecture and source code. At the architecture level, we focus on the organization of the entire system. We talk about components, connectors. At the source code level, we focus on implementation details. We focus on data structure, algorithms. The second challenge, both of these two artifacts can be frequent, frequently changed during software evolution. In particular, in architecture-centric development, software architecture can be changed a lot. So there are a number of existing work that have been done in this area for architecture implementation conformance. Some of them simply require that only the architecture can be manually changed, and we call them one-way mapping. Most of the approaches, or existing approaches, are classified as two-way mapping here because they allow both architecture and source code to be changed. One of the most uh, latest approaches here is Darcy, which was published in this year's IXI at uh, Montreal, Canada. It was developed by Sam and Josh and their student here at UC Irvine. Congratulations. I have been working on architecture implementation mapping since I was a PhD student here at UC Irvine. So this table shows the agenda or the roadmap of my research in this area. The first row here shows the work that I've done as a PhD student. So there I focused on single system development. The primary challenge involved at that point was to automatically map evolutionary changes made in the architecture to source code primarily to maintain both structure conformance and behavior conformance between software architecture and code. After that, after I graduated here, I moved on to product line development, and there I identified a new challenge called variability conformance, which is what I'm going to talk about later. And then the challenge there is about implementing and evolving variation points involved in architecture. I've also recently started to work on architecture-based adaptation. And there, we're building a new approach called dynamic uh, uh, architecture implementation mapping to make sure that architecture and source code are consistent at runtime. So this slide shows my PhD work. I see my PhD uh, dissertation committee member here, so I don't want to spend too much time here. But one thing I do want to point out here is that the approach is named one point x way mapping, primarily because we used a new code separation approach to separate generated code and user-defined code into separate code modules. Only the architecture and user-defined code module can be manually changed. That is why it's called one point x way mapping. <coughs> Today, I'm going to focus on product line development. A software product line is a family of software products that are similar to each other in many ways. An important difference between product line development and single system development is that the artifacts that we focus on during product line development, such as product line features, product line architecture, they all contain so-called variation points that represent the differences between the products. And these variation points can impose new challenges, for example, on architecture implementation mapping. Uh, here I call it variability conformance. More specifically, it means we want to make sure that a variation point in product line architecture and its implementation in source code, for example, even though both of them are optional, we want to make sure 
they are related to the same set of product line features. That's example of their ability conformance. The challenges involved here are similar to what I mentioned earlier. Abstraction gap between architectural variability and existing variability implementation technologies. And also, both of them can evolve during product line evolution. So here's an example of software product line. It's a chat application. On the top, on the left, is architecture, only three components there. On the right, it's a simple ver version of the chat application. It only allows two users to send text messages to each other. On the bottom is a more advanced version of chat application. So as we see here, we have more components and connectors there. But actually, you can find that three of them are actually identical to the architecture that we see on the top. That is server and two clients components. So this is, ex this is an example of software product line application and its product line architectures. And this is an approach that I have developed to support product line architecture implementation mapping. Here I call it one point, at one point X line mapping. Uh, the diagram here shows the overview of the approach. Those boxes, they represent artifacts that are managed by our approach at different abstraction levels. All those represent tools that we have built. I will talk about them in the next slide. So our approach includes three techniques. The first one is that we integrate feature specification into the architecture model. The benefit is that they can evolve at the same time. For example, if you make some changes to the feature model, then architecture can be automatically changed. At the code level, uh, in addition to code generation and separation, which is borrowed from one point x way mapping, we developed a new technique called architecture-based code annotation. So we use that in user-defined code to identify code fragments that are related to product line features. So that, for example, when the architecture model is changed, then our source code, our separated code modules, can be automatically updated via code regeneration and annotation processing. We also support automatic identification of feature-related code from annotation analysis, as we see there on the right side. Following the tradition of our research group here at UC Irvine, we implemented our approach, we built tools to implement it. And our implementation platform is ArtStudio. So for those who have heard of ArtStudio, or who care about ArtStudio, I'm proud to say uh, ArtStudio is still alive. <laughs> and, um, and uh, <laughs> it has been used by classes uh, by hundreds of students, and I have got many positive feedback. So in that regard, I really want to say thank you to the developer of our studio, Dr. Eric Dashafi, who is sitting out there. <laughs> so could you please join me and give him another round of applause? Thank you, Eric. I really appreciate that. And on top of our studio, we build a list of the tools, which is what I'm going to demonstrate next. What we see on screen is the architecture model of a chatting application that we developed using our tool. On the left is a list of its features defined in the same architecture model. The tool can automatically highlight the related architecture elements for a selected feature following its traceability links. The user can further view code fragments in one of these components that are related to the selected feature. All the related feature code fragments are attached with an annotation that contains the names of the related features. The code is highlighted in the same color. In this case, only several code blocks are highlighted and they all have the corresponding annotations. The highlighting color can also be easily changed. Select the color, save the change, and reselect the feature. The color of the related architecture elements are automatically changed. So is the color of the related code fragments. 
The tool can also show code fragments related to different features at the same time. They are shown in different colors which correspond to different features. These two lines of code are related to three features, which is why they are highlighted with three colors in parallel. Before we move on to the next scenario, let's run the chatting application first to see how it works. And later on, we are going to make some changes and run it again. The application has two chatting client windows. It allows the user to send text messages also, we can choose a message from the template, such as a smiley face, play tic-tac-toe, and view chatting history. Our tool can also automatically update both architecture and code when the related features are changed. As an example, let's remove the chat history feature. Click OK. The tool begins to process architecture and code. The corresponding architecture elements are removed. In addition, the code is also processed. Remember these lines of code were highlighted as feature-related code in the first scenario we showed you. Now they are all commented out as to-do tasks. Now let's rerun the updated application to see how it works. The chat history button that was at the bottom of the chat client is now removed. Now let's make another change to the features of the chatting application. We are renaming the game feature to be named Tic-Tac-Toe. Click OK. This time the architecture is not changed. However, if we look at the source code, the related code annotations have been automatically updated with the new feature name, Tic-Tac-Toe. In this way, each feature and its design and implementation are kept consistent. Let's use a tool to derive a new chatting application. It does not include features template and game. Both architecture and code will be generated. This is a project where the new application will be derived. Here we need to select the project to store the derived architecture and code and specify the name of the derived architecture. Refresh the project. Here we can see a portion of the code and a new architecture file that have been derived. Next we need to finish the second step, generating code from the derived architecture. Here is the derived architecture. Right-click the canvas, select Map Architecture to Code, and code generation starts. The derivation process is complete. Now let's run the derived chatting application. the end of our demo. Thank you for watching. How much time do you guys do you have? Um, a couple of minutes. <coughs> so three capabilities that I have just demonstrated. Uh, since I'm running short of time, I'll go a little quickly on evaluation part. So for the evaluation, we mainly focused on the applicability and capabilities of our approach. So we want to make sure that our approach and tool can actually be used, can be applied to real software systems. And also all those capabilities that I just demonstrated, they can be used in real software development. So to do that, we applied our approach to an existing open source system called Apache Soar. It has approximately 181,000 lines of code. So we created its architecture model, and then after that, we refactored source code using our approach, using architecture-based code annotations. Then at the end, we tried to evolve the system. So we had some findings. We validated our capabilities, the capability and 
applicability of our approach, we also find that there are some limitations of our approach. For example, our approach currently does not support feature relationships, mutual dependency, mutual, ex mutual exclusion. The user has to manually manage that. Some related work, uh, our work is related to three research areas, architecture implementation mapping, software variability implementation, and product and feature mapping. So here I have listed some existing work and highlighted some of their main limitations. All right, to summarize my uh, presentation, I have this slide here on the top. I have listed three architecture implementation mapping approaches I, that I mentioned earlier. One point X remapping for single system development. One point X line mapping for product line development. And in the future, I will be working on architecture based self adaptation. In fact, we have already developed a prototype called Dynamix. Uh, at the bottom, I know why you're laughing. <laughs> because Mix is an existing framework. So we extended it, we gave it a new name. On the bottom, show the timeline of our work together with related main publications and some of the tools that we have built. All the work started from 2008 when I just passed my PhD phase two written exam here. So after that, I started to do literature, literature review on architecture implementation mapping. Um, it has been quite a journey, but I really enjoyed it. Uh, in particular, I feel fortunate that I have been able to work with these two wonderful individuals. My PhD advisor, Dr. Dick Taylor, who is sitting out there. Thank you, Dick. And my master's student, Kong Koo. He doesn't like taking pictures. It took me a while <laughs> to convince him I took this picture for him. <laughs> um, he's not here today, Ryan is working in Texas as a software engineer. But I really want to thank Dick for all the help and support. When I was a PhD student here, he helped me a lot. After I graduated here, he continuously offered me all the support, guidance, mentor. Thank you, Dick. I appreciate that. Some references. Um, <coughs> That's it. Thank you very much, Sam, for inviting me here. Thank you. Time for a couple of uh, quick questions. Is there any? Uh, when you do this uh, transformations or rewriting on source code, do you provide any guarantees about the correctness of the transformation, like type safety and this kind of uh, property? Uh, for the type safety, that is actually a challenging issue in product line development. Right now, in that regard, we support simple type type of type uh, type correctness check. For example, we only support uh, lines of code that are related to multiple features at the same time. There can be more advanced logic. For example, same line of code related to two features at the same time. That type of logic we do not support. Thank you. Other questions, comments? All right, let's thank you. Thank you. So our, our next speaker is uh, the newest member of the, or one of the newest members of the software engineering group at UCI. Um, uh, so it's Abdekar Ahmed. Um, he uh, received his PhD from Oregon State University. And uh, he's going to talk to us about um, improving quality of software using bus terminal prediction. Thank you, sir. So, uh, my today's talk is about improving quality of software using bus terminal prediction. And before I go into the details of the talk, let me briefly <coughs> talk about myself. So, as Sam mentioned, I graduated last year and literally first year assistant professor. And my research is about ensuring quality of software. Uh, and for that, I look into different aspects of the software development process, like the people, process, and productivity characteristics, and try to extract those features that has an impact on the produced software, right, on the quality of the software. And that, in short, is my research all about. And I have been doing that for throughout my PhD and for the last one year. So <clears throat> moving to today's topic, 
So we all know software is a crucial part of our life, right? It's in everything and it's everywhere. Nowadays, even our microwaves and fridges, refrigerators also have software in them. And because of this interconnectedness, this omnipresence of software, uh, the cost of software failure has been increasing. So what I mean by that is in most, uh, most recent times, we have seen software failures causing human lives to be lost. Like 157 people were killed in March of uh, 2019 uh, because of software failure in Boeing 737 MAX. And then last year, uh, this Uber <laughs> killed a pedestrian. Again, it was because of the software failure. And in terms of uh, monetary values or cost of failure, in 2017, we saw uh, 606 fails reported by 314 companies. $1.7 trillion were lost because of software failure. 3.6 billion people were affected, which is almost half of the total population of the Earth. And in total, 268 human years were lost because of software failure. And <clears throat> these are all self-reported numbers, right? So uh, if we are actually somehow get our hands on the actual number of failures, those would have been a lot higher than what we are seeing here. So what have we been doing in, in order to ensure the quality of software? As a research community, we have been trying many things. For uh, formal verification, model checking, testing, uh, fault prediction. Along these lines, we learned one uh, important lesson, is that the earlier we can identify a bug, identify a fault, the, the less it's going to cost us in terms of fixing it, in terms of money, right? So along those lines, what people or what researchers have been looking at for last uh, decade is predicting bugs, right? So trying to predict the bug in the current version. And for that, uh, researchers have looked at file developer project related characteristics. They have looked at communication, mailing list discussions, issue tracking systems, doing mining on those, and then of course doing source code analysis and trying to bring all these things together in order to predict the bugs in the current version, current version of software. And while doing this, uh, we actually achieved a very good accuracy. So only using code metric, we achieved 0.67 F major. Process metric, uh, 0.5. Not so good, but okay-ish. Not okay, so it's merely random. And then using a combination of process and code metric, achieved 0.8 accuracy or F major, and social technical metric gave us 0.78 F major. Right, so these numbers are quite good. Like, uh, almost as human, as, uh, equivalent to human performance. So, but again, these are all in terms of bug prediction, right? Bug prediction in the current version. <clears throat> what about the predicting the parts of the code that are going to be buggy in the future versions, right? Bug proneness prediction. So to explain the difference between bug prediction and bug proneness prediction, I will use an analogy of visiting the dentist. So bug in our code, digital equivalent is having a cavity in your teeth. So bug prediction is an x-ray that can help a dentist to spot a hidden cavity, right? That is bug prediction. Now bug proneness prediction is dentist discovering a weakness in your enamel or a plaque buildup, which is not a problem in the current version, but is going to be a problem in the future versions, right? So this is the analogy or difference between bug prediction and bug proneness prediction. And I'm focusing on bug proneness prediction for the rest of the talk. So again, both of these are trying to find problems in the code, right? One is in the current version and the other one is in the future versions. And for doing that, obviously, we have to look at the similar kind of features. By similar kind of features, I mean file, developer, and project related characteristics. Again, mailing list, bug tracking systems, and of course, uh, source code analysis. However, one major difference is we are interested in bugs or faults appearing in the future versions of software, right? And this is where the difference is, uh, the future version. So for doing this, what we did is we developed this unique uh, technique or novel technique. So the basic idea is you start by selecting any random epoch in the project's lifetime, and then just keep tracking those statements across the lifetime of the project, right? And of course, try to identify what kind of change is happening to those statements. Is that a bug fix or a non-bug fixing activity? A non-bug fixing activity can be uh, adding a new test case or uh, doing some simple refactoring, right? Those kind of activities. So essentially what we do is we track those statements across the lifetime of the project until they are essentially rewritten by a non-bug fixing activity, right? And we just keep count of these uh, activities that happen, or bug fixing activities that happen. 
So using this simple technique, what we found is if we use traditional metric for predicting the buck proneness, uh, the adjusted R square value is 0.47 which is not so good, but also not so bad, because we are talking about adjusted R-square values, right? And any adjusted R-square value in the range of 0.2 to 0.4 is acceptable. So, okay, this, this looks okay, -ish, but can we actually improve it even more? So, <clears throat> for, in order to improve it, we need to look at other factors, right? Other factors, technical factors, such as code smells. So, uh, uh, code smells, those of you who are not familiar with the idea, uh, the basic idea, it was developed a uh, couple of, actually has been more than a decade. Uh, the basic idea was to identify the problems which could lead to future maintainability problems. Right? That's the basic idea. And code smells are not syntax error nor compiler warnings. Because if it was either of those, the compiler would start streaming and <coughs> developer hopefully would fix it. Uh, unfortunately, code smells don't create warnings or compiler warnings. Essentially, these are symptoms of poor design or implementation choices, right? So to give a concrete example what a code smell looks like, uh, dot class. This is one of the most frequently encountered smells or code smells in the wild. So what dot class tries to do is tries to do too many things, right? And again, we all know go, uh, good object-oriented design principles dictate that classes should not try to do too many things it should try to do a simple thing, a specialized thing. Whereas God classes actually break that uh, uh, rule. So this is an intuitive explanation, good for understanding, but if I was to uh, implement a tool for identifying God class, the way it would be done is identify classes with high coupling, low cohesion, and having high complexity, and tag that as a God class. And again, if you notice here, Good object-oriented design principles dictate that classes should have high cohesion and low coupling, which is exactly the opposite of what we are seeing in, form, uh, in case of God class. So what happens if I include God class, or code, not God class only, but code smell in buck proneness prediction? So we actually see a huge jump in the prediction accuracy uh, the moment we include code smells, right? Almost double, almost getting double. But that's good, and it actually has reached human level performance, 0.8. So can we actually make it even better? Right? Let's try to push it, because it's not perfect. It's not one yet. So we started looking at socio-technical aspects. So the question may arise, why suddenly socio-technical aspect? The reason is, software development is a socio-technical process. Right? It involves humans. It involves group of people. It involves discussion. So we should not completely uh, discard the fact that this is a socio-technical process. And that's why we looked into this. And one of the things that we identified to be socio-technical factor was merge conflict. Right? Again, the question may arise, uh, why merge conflict is a socio-technical factor? It's a purely technical factor. Uh, I have some arguments against that. I'll go there. So again, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of merge conflict, though I'm uh, kind of suspicious that everyone here knows it, just a quick uh, intro. Right, so a merge conflict ha happens when multiple people work on the same piece of code or same file. So here, Alice and Bob started on their working on their branches, copied from a, a master branch, and both of them at some point worked on file F2. So when they were trying to actually merge this code back, they ran into a conflict on file F2. Right, that's the basic idea of merge conflict. And going back to the question, why is merge conflict a socio-technical factor? Because the moment it happens, uh, it, first of all, it happens because the way the software has been architected, the way the collaboration uh, happens, right? How uh, people distribute the work among themselves. And also, the moment it happens, you actually have to stop what you're doing, try to resolve it. And by resolving, what I mean is you have to discuss, you have to even argue, go into arguments or even fight, right? And then you can only fix it. So literally, this becomes an immediate concern. So, that kind of justifies using this as a socio-technical factor. So good, <clears throat> we included that in our prediction model and achieved better prediction than what we had last time, right? So better improved from 0.81 to 0.87. However, uh, the problem is not all statements are involved in a merge conflict, right? So merge conflict uh, statements that are involved in a merge conflict is limited. So can we somehow, uh, uh, in the absence of merge conflict, what is the other factor that we can use, right? 
Uh, so again, we need better predictors. So what we started looking into is uh, other factors that has been associated with bugs, right? Not bug proneness, but bugs or buggy characteristics. And what we found is entropy is one of those things that people have found to be associated with bugs. Again, what entropy tries to do is uh, tries just to give a, gives a measurement of difference of an entity and the rest of the code base. Some people have used this as a measurement of naturalness of code. And also uh, has been shown by research that highly entropic code is harder to maintain and associated with bugs. <coughs> and entropy impacts readability. So I will come back to this point, why I have entropy impacts readability in the net later slides. But for now, uh, we used entropy in our bug proneness prediction model and found that, yes, it actually helps uh, the prediction by a lot, right? So we have 0.92. So that's quite high. Like, so at this point, we can actually stop. However, this, we cannot stop, right? Because it's 0.92, it's not one. We can never achieve one, but nothing is stopping us from pushing it further. So we need to, what we need to do is need to identify new metrics, right? New factors. And this actually led to an interesting observation or a study by itself. So as I said, as I mentioned earlier in the slide, that entropy is associated with readability. And the basic idea was if code is less readable, it should lead to more bugs, right? Should lead to more bugs in the future. So we looked into that. And this is the formula that uh, Postnet and L proposed for measuring readability. And using this formula, we did a large scale study. Uh, Software is collected from GitHub open source software, and what we found is that from a, in a scale of zero to one, most of the projects have very high readability score, like very, very high. And even if you see here, the dip that you can see is in the range of 0 0.005, right? Like it's very, very small. So what this is telling us, uh, this uh, graph here, is that our projects, our open source projects in general, are very highly readable. And they remain highly readable across the life of the project. Again, that should be something that should make us happy. However, the problem is, in a prior study, we found that projects become more and more smelly as they grow older. So if projects are becoming more smelly, then that should obviously lead to obfuscation, not obfuscation, but uh, difficulty of reading code, understanding code. And obviously, that should lead to less readability. So either this one is false or this one is false. And our uh, analysis kind of showed that most likely, this is not capturing the notion of readability. Because if you look at this formula, it does not uh, capture the uh, notion of nestedness, does not know, capture the notion of the vari uh, variables having a uh, hard to understand name. All those aspects are missing. And also, this uh, formula was, was developed by analyzing on this small scale kind of toy problem, uh, programs. So what that means is this needs to be uh, Reanalyzed or uh, re-examined. So again, coming back regarding what are the next steps that we need to do. Uh, obviously, identify new metrics, and then of course uh, do just-in-time prediction, right? Because if we can do it in just-in-time, the context is fresh in developers' mind, and uh, we need to do that. And the other one is right. So don't just tell me uh, that there is a problem or there is a potential problem. Tell me how to solve it, right? How tell me how to fix it. So that leads to an uh, uh, area of automatic bug proneness repair. So to conclude, software is everything in everything, and it's everywhere. And uh, to reduce the cost of maintaining software, we need to identify the bugs as soon as possible. And obviously, we have reached a very high accuracy, but we need better predictors. And in that pursuit, we have been looking at different aspects. And yes, we, we need to, once we have predicted them, uh, with enough accuracy, we need to go into these areas, which I'm actively pursuing right now. And that's it. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll say. Hey, I just want to ask some clarifying questions. So uh, basically, what kind of benchmarks did we use for the prediction? So right. Yeah. So for benchmarking, we use defects for jet. Okay. And also, what we did is we actually manually curated our own data set across 43 projects, and we used that for uh, benchmarking. Okay, uh, so comparing. What, great. So what are the ground truths? Like, which ones do you think is like bug prone? Which ones do you think is not bug prone? So I didn't understand the question. Can you oh, repeat it? Oh, what's the ground truths? 
for your, for your prediction, right? So which right, so what we did is we took 43 projects from GitHub yeah. and we manually analyzed the commits, uh, like uh, 1,500 commits okay. across the life of, the, of those projects and <laughs> manually analyzed them to be either bug fixing or non-bug fixing. All right. And then, so what we have at the end of that process is this, for this project, for this line, this went through this many bug fixes. Okay. Right, so, and that is our ground truth. And then we build the model and see whether our model can predict that accurately or not. Okay, I see, I see. So within your, like as I said, you know, what's the ratio of the, like, uh, like uh, for example, the correct uh, instances, what's the, how, what's the ratio of the, like, buggy instances? Because we need to post the post, like, uh, the, the, the negative and positive instances for the prediction, right? Right. For training, yeah. So what's the ratio for both of that? So, uh, I don't exactly remember the number of ra uh, the ratio uh -huh. top of my head, but again, uh, the accuracy was not high, right? So yeah. I know that doesn't answer your question, but the, I don't exactly remember the ratio, but it was not, uh, the oversampling, undersampling issue was not there. We had checked at that point. I don't remember the exact number right now. Okay. Was there another, yeah, yeah. menu? Uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm intrigued by this distinction between bug prediction and bug proneness prediction. Mm -hmm. So to understand correctly, like the distinction would be you'd find a module, the bug prediction says it's fine, but the bug proneness prediction actually says, oh, but you're going to introduce exactly. a bug in the future. Right. It's not um, introduce so the bug, uh, but you are going to run into bugs in the future. But then what exactly is the bug prediction telling you? Is it actually telling you this is a bug right here on this line of code? No, like uh, that would be bug prediction, right? That yeah. there is the most there is this bug in this line based on these this, this characteristics. What bug proneness prediction tells you is that uh, the way you have written it, uh, most likely you are going to there is going to be a bug introduced on this line in the next couple of versions. We don't predict the number of versions it's going to take it, but we are just saying that okay there is going to be most likely a bug in this line in the upcoming future. So you're saying the line is correct now, but it's going to be incorrect later. Versus yes, exactly. Quick question. On the last two charts, smelliness versus readability, uh, I couldn't see which one you were pointing at when you said you doubted that it was accurate. All right, so I was uh, pointing at the readability score okay. because projects on an average cannot have that high readability because this, this model, first of all, was developed based on small programs. And second of all, doesn't even just by looking at it, you can see that, okay, it's not capturing all notions. So, and again, I mean, Knowing developers, we know that we don't really like so good code. So, all right, let's take the uh, additional questions uh, during lunch. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, our last speaker is uh, Bill Griswold. He's a professor uh, in, in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at San Diego. Uh, he's been uh, uh, co-chair of ICSI and FSC, those are the top two conferences in the field, for, uh, which I someone knows, and he's been also the ACM SIGSOC chair, and uh, you know, we're excited to, uh, to listen to his talk on differential invariance for assisting development and code review. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here today. So code review is becoming an increasingly popular supplement to testing, both in industry and uh, in open source projects. It's a systematic examination of the submitted code prior to its acceptance into the code base. The trend today is towards what we call lightweight code review, which means you just have a couple of people looking at the code at most, and the focus is on whether the submitted code resolves the issue uh, uh, that um, the developer was uh, uh, coding for. It's desirable to be applied to all commits, not just to critical code. And as one example, uh, recently it was found that uh, devs at Mozilla were performing between five and 21 code reviews per week. So what are the main inputs to code review? Well, you know the tests have passed, you get a coverage report, uh, and you get a code diff. And if we go into, say, GitHub, this is what you're looking at. Uh, you, uh, you have some description of the fix, uh, you have a list of changed files, uh, and you get this uh, code diff down here. And as you go into code review and you start looking at this, the first question that comes to mind is how does this change affect the method's outputs? Right. That's going to involve some tracing. I have to do some code reading. And then you're also um, thinking, are these the only methods that are affected by the change? Usually not, right? That uh, usually, you know, that the changes, uh, behavioral changes can propagate through the source code, changed or not. 
And so that's more tracing to do. And so we asked ourselves, could we bring more semantic information to code review to make it more cost effective, basically less code reading? And we th thought about, well, what about logic and predicates, logic predicates inferred over method inputs and outputs? So for example, here's a pop method uh, from a stack class. And here's its test cases. Uh, and if we uh, ran this code and examined the inputs and the outputs, or ran the tests, we could infer that this top, ten, top index is always greater than or equal to 1 on entry to pop. And uh, it's always greater than or equal to 0 on exit. And of course, obviously, top index equals, uh, the new top index equals the old top index minus 1. OK, so that's really cool. And uh, there's a system called Dicon that can infer these things. Uh, and Dicon calls them likely invariants. I'm going to call them likely invariants, or just sometimes plain invariants. But please remember, this is actually inferred from data traces. The problem with uh, taking this approach is that the, that the invariants are numerous. And, and uh, it's, it's just not uh, uh, practical to navigate these. However, if we think about a diff of the invariants, just like a code diff, uh, then we can get something uh, different. And here we're looking at the diff of the invariance since the last commit, because that's the increment we're interested in when you check in or when you, when you uh, commit uh, your code for the issue. It's much shorter. Uh, and we can easily see what's been added, changed, and deleted. Uh, and this view is exactly focused on the code reviewer's task, which is, did the dev's changes achieve the requested behavior change? There it is. It's presented to you. So uh, to this end, we developed a tool called Getty. It's a tool for what we call Semantics Assisted Code Review. And I'm just going to demo quickly uh, a, uh, a, a, the review of an issue fix from the JSON project, uh, which is uh, Google's open source uh, JSON implementation. So at the top here, uh, we see the change source and the change tests. And I've selected, uh, uh, oops, I forgot to tell you what this uh, what this is about. So let's tell you. So um, uh, lazily parsed long number long value was reported to be working incorrectly. In particular, it's throwing exceptions on inputs, uh, string inputs like 1.0. Uh, and uh, the specification clearly indicates it should be rounding or truncating instead of throwing an exception. Okay, so that's the code fix, and we're going to review that. Okay, so except I've uh, selected long value here for review uh, as I began. And what we're looking at here is a kind of a summary of the call graph, if you will, uh, around lazily parsed long number. And we can see it's called by a couple of things, in particular a modified test. Red is uh, a code that is modified and has new invariants, and gray means uh, uh, no change. So uh, scrolling down, here, here are my, here's my invariant diff. And I can see that, OK, it looks like we, we're passing in 1.0 and we're turning 1. I'm immediately concerned, like, wait a second, are we only running one test case here? The answer is yes. Um, but uh, Dicon helps us with this. The other thing is like, hey, where's that exception that I'm supposed to get? And it's like, oh, wait a second. I'm looking at the invariant changes due to both changes in the source and the tests. I want to isolate it to just the source changes. So I select this, which is now going to run our new tests on the old code. And now we can say, oh, yeah, we're replacing that exception that was reported with return equals 1. That's better. I'm feeling really good about that. So now I can. Uh, uh, but with a sense of um, that this might be correct, I can scan down and say, look, this is the code diff now. Yes, the developer replaced big integer a call with a big decimal call. If you go look at the Java documentation, you're starting to feel pretty good about this. And a review is over. We're going to ask for some more tests. Because we really want to see how that rounding truncation thing, if that's actually working, right? OK. So, uh, so what happened here? Getty helped me uh, with three, answer three questions. How has this commit changed the app's behavior? The tool extracted the, the likely invariance for the previous commit, the likely invariance for the current commit, and computed and displayed their diff. I could see the behavioral changes. And then it helped answer the question, how are these methods affecting each other? We had those, the coloring, uh, and we had the call graph summary, so I could anticipate the test cases are affecting the source code, you know, things like that, right? Great. Uh, and last, what behaviors are due to changes to the source versus to the test? Because I was able to switch this, those conditions, and I was able to isolate just the source changes. And so uh, the basic idea is that we hold either the source of the test constant, we held the test constant uh, while changing the other, and we could get a diff just for those. 
So what we did is we ran the source commit on all tests, um, uh, the previous source commit on all tests, the current source commit on all tests, and we got the diff, and that's how we got that isolation. Okay, you're thinking, great, worked on one example, but what about other issues in other programs? So we looked at a bunch of other uh, programs, JSON plus a bunch from Apache, varying sizes and complexities, and, the, and we looked at 100, so you start by looking at 100 test-only commits, and these are quite common because the most common review, just like the one I just generated, is you need more tests. So here comes that commit. We looked at 100 of those, randomly selected. Uh, we got the ground truth by uh, brute force, my poor graduate student, Jan, and he found out of those 100 <laughs> that it was able to correctly identify 32 as insufficient uh, with a false hit rate of 4 um, out of that 100. Uh, so we were really pleased by that. Um, uh, and uh, the, we also looked at, can it find bugs? So we selected one random bug for each of these projects uh, and was able to uh, find a bug in four out of the six cases. Uh, as an example of why uh, some of these fail, uh, the codec uh, program, it's a codec, and it's basically producing these long serialized strings. There was a bug in a substring, and Dicon doesn't infer uh, uh, string patterns. It doesn't have templates for it. They can be added. But I'm suspecting these bizarre strings, there, there was probably no hope anyway. But that's the kind of reason uh, that you might fail here. All right, so uh, you're saying, OK, that was great. Your graduate student found some bugs and some uh, uh, tests, uh, uh, insufficient testing. What about real people? OK, we performed a laboratory study. We recruited 18 graduate students and undergrads from UCSD. We grouped them into pairs so we could hear their conversations in the recordings. Uh, we had three pairs in a control. Uh, we had six pairs using Getty. And we had them review three issues from GSON. Uh, and uh, it was actually a two-phase process where they'd submit the reviews. The developer would reply. They would, they, these were cooked responses, obviously. Uh, and then they would do a second review. So there are six reviews total for these three issues. Uh, what we found is that Getty improves the review process. So in the control condition, they, uh, uh, we found they performed what uh, we saw as a bottom-up code reading. They would first read the issue description, then they would analyze the code diff, that's what they're getting, right, on a per-class basis. Uh, then they would co-interpret the diff and uh, the issue description, hoping to get some more insight on the code diff. Uh, and then they would ultimately go to start code reading. Uh, they would read code for a really long time, they would get tired, uh, and eventually they would write the best review they could and then rinse, lather, repeat over all the uh, changed uh, files um, in the code diff. In Getty, they did something very different. They did top-down hypothesis testing. So how did that work? They read the issue description, then they started looking at the diffs, and then they'd formulate hypotheses. Well, if the invariants looked like this, they must have done that. Uh, maybe they did this. You know? So uh, then they would actually go and verify these hypotheses uh, and, and then write the review. And so what we saw here is a much more directed process, one they could complete in a reasonable amount of time without running out of steam. Uh, and, um, uh, and so that, this was very positive. Now, you know, you have to understand, be able to understand invariance to a modest degree. And one flaw uh, we saw, or problem we saw, is that sometimes they formed the hypothesis and took it as truth, and they forgot to verify the hypothesis. Uh, so that's future work. Clearly, you know, user interface design could help with that but we're very pleased with this outcome. Uh, so uh, now you might be thinking, wow, that's great. Shouldn't developers have these tools too? Yeah, because they could see whether, uh, developers could see whether their ongoing edits are creating the expected behavior changes, heading off bugs that would later be found in code review. So the idea was, would be that we would recalculate the invariant diffs whenever the code becomes compilable. The challenge is performance, because now we're going to be doing this real time while the developer is sitting there. So as background, uh, if you're going to do this naively, this is how it works. You have your test cases and you have your source, and you're going to instrument all of your source to gather the input and output values for every method so we can uh, 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 use those for extracting these in, like invariants. Then you're going to run all your test cases on all the code, and this takes forever. Uh, it runs out of you know, uh, virtual memory and you know, all sorts of stuff. Sometimes they don't even complete. So that's, but that was naive, right? So the thing that we recognize is that you're only looking, as a developer, you're looking at a single method at a time. And, and that's the one I'm changing, and that's the one I want the invariance for. So 
uh, let's drop those, uh, all that tracing, and then we can do this again. And so this is better, but it's still too slow. We're, st we're still at multiple minutes here. Um, and, but you probably thought, wait a second, most of those test cases didn't run that code. That's right, we can do uh, test minimization, regression test selection, and now we can just run the test required, and now we have you know, incremental uh, <coughs> runtime. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's the, uh, that's the essence of, of the story uh, for how we got really good performance. All right, so now I'm gonna show you, this is a video of, um, of that bug that we saw, that we reviewed earlier, that bug fix. This is now, the bug is back, and we're going to fix it here and say, hey, what would the, what would the developer see here? And this is really about the interactive time. We're not gonna see the invariant diff over here, um, but you're still getting, because uh, it's a slightly different version of the code, but uh, you, can, um, you can see how long it takes. Uh, and I'm gonna play some music, no, I'm not, uh, to distract you to see how long it takes, because it takes, it takes a few seconds. So uh, here we go. Uh, see. All right, so you see here, there's our big integer bug here. Gotta go in, change that to big decimal. And we see we have some invariants for another test case here but um, uh, wait for it, it's gonna take a few seconds, um, and we're gonna see the invariants we're looking for showing up, and it's gonna be very gratifying to the developer, except of course the developer's gonna know they need to write more test cases, because it's gonna show that input is 1.0, output is one, uh, you know, have more work to do, okay? So, um, oops, there we go. Uh, so uh, that's my talk, and I'd be happy to take any questions. This is implemented uh, for Java. Daikon itself is uh, language uh, neutral, but because we have to build all these additional tools, you know, we've been focusing on Java, yeah. Obviously, it's generalizable. Yeah, Emerson. Yeah, hey, but uh, I'm wondering about the larger process. Developers do code review all the time, and I'm wondering what proportion of those this tool is going to be helpful for, and whether they're going to need to use this tool on every pull request so like, I'm wondering about the times where the tool is actually not going to be useful, but they're still going to be able to tap over the output anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, in, what I showed you in the middle of the talk there is that it, it was a big help with test-only commits. Uh, about a third of the time it found a problem. Uh, and uh, it's probably you know, closer to half the time it's a problem. So, but you know, it's not catching everything, but it's, it's catching a lot of stuff. You think of it as kind of like bug finding. There's a bug in your commit if it doesn't have enough tests. That was great. We also saw four out of so, uh, six in the test cases, um, uh, in, the, in the bug fix, uh, introducing bugs cases. Uh, and then there's just seeing the invariance and saying, wow, yeah, that's, that's what I expected, which is what I, I demoed at the beginning. Uh, it's not going to work for every case. You probably uh, know some things about DICON. It doesn't have templates for everything. It focuses, it focuses on um, uh, simple values like integers, strings, uh, Booleans, doubles, and things like that. And there's lots of research on doing better than that. Can basically, you know, people have shown how to do design by contract, so you could actually get a lot closer to what people think about in terms of invariance. Um, but I expect it could work a lot. Um, what we've really spent a lot of time on is the performance, uh, because uh, if you're waiting for it, then it's a problem. Oh, Lee, and then yeah. Oh, yeah. <coughs> so yeah, so uh, I like the idea to reduce the uh, environment inference cost by only like infer the environment for those change method. Mm -hmm. Have you ever considered there can be some other methods that are not changed, but they may be affected by those change methods? So whose environment may also be helpful to review the code? Yes. Yeah. So so we do that. So uh, if in the uh, in the Getty tool, the one I demoed at the beginning, it computes an impact set and then computes it in variance in batch for all of them. And that's what's shipped to the code reviewer. All right, okay. and so yeah, that, that's absolutely an issue and you just want it all, you know, computed in advance and, the, and as soon as the code reviewer hits the button, boom, you see everything and can get everything you want instantaneously. What I demoed at the end was the, the, the developer's view of it, which is you're staring at this method now and then you're gonna go look at another method and it'll just compute the invariance on the fly as you go, but uh, yeah. So there's, there's a little bit of a trade-off between you know, batch, which I think is appropriate for code review, 
versus uh, sort of on the fly for the developer. And, the, and of course, the, the developer could jump into code review too and review their own code, and they could say, okay, let's go, let's go back to the code review tool, and now I want to see the impact set and do all that stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this is neat. Um, in prior research that we did, different, but um, we also needed to run test cases from the prior version on the onto the next version. Mm -hmm. And we found that, you know, semi-frequently the method signature was changed. Or, you know, yeah. and then that means that you can't you can't right. do that. Did you right. find that often? Yeah, I mean that happens. And basically those those generate uh, if they they compile errors and it just nothing shows up or they can generate exceptions and then they show up. Uh, and it's 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 data. Right, so uh, the fact that you aren't getting new invariants from your old test cases is, is signal, right? Um, so, uh, as I said, that uh, when we were doing our experiments, we found that the, the code reviewers did need to understand what invariants are and how they work, uh, things like that. And so there, it, there is a certain amount of expertise involved to know what you're seeing when you see input 1.0 string, string 1.0, output return equals one, you're like, there was only one test here. You just kind of go there. Whereas I think someone who's unfamiliar with tests is like, well, okay, seems fine. You know, I'm, I'm familiar with invariants, right? So, um, so I think you get, you, when, as you use these tools, you get to know them and then you can handle the nuance of those, those issues. Yeah. But that definitely, definitely happens. Refactoring, you know, th this tool will give you interesting data for refactoring because it's, you know, none of the old tests run. But then you're just looking at the, basically you're back to the condition of, I'm looking at the changes of my source and the tests at the same time, you know. Um, but then the, if method names change, what, that's what you'll see in the, in the invariant summaries is it looks the same, but oh wait, the method changed, you know, so you, that's how the summaries tend to come out because we're just, we're not trying to resolve names, change names. We're just, it's like, hey, this is a change, look at it. All right, let's thank Bill. Thank you, thank you very much.